This is Leslie Sinclair, to whom I will dedicate today's TED Talk. Leslie died at the age of 27, after battling cancer for 10 years. Now, when I think back of those times, I ask myself, are we doing enough to eradicate all these horrible diseases from the world? Now, that's a very ambitious goal, and I know it. So let me rephrase. Can we do more? And my answer to that question is a certain yes, we can. And let me explain to you why I think that is true. Did you know that for about half of all the medical procedures, there is no solid scientific evidence? That is, one in every two medical procedures, there is no solid scientific evidence. And we all know that healthcare costs are skyrocketing. Let me give you an example. Every year, 230 million surgical operations are being performed at a cost of nearly half a trillion dollars. Now, one quarter of all those medical surgical operations <coughs> develop complications and they have to be re-hospitalized at a cost of about $12,000 per patient on average. People who are in hospital, back in hospital after a complication have an eight times higher probability of dying in hospital. And the surprising fact is that half of these are preventable. So what are we going to do about that? I believe we need a project of similar ambition and scale as putting a man on the moon. Almost 50 years ago, man walked on the moon. And it was a project at the bleeding edge of what was technologically possible at the time. And it was driven by a vision of men and women who knew what could be accomplished. I believe with a similar project in healthcare, we can revolutionize healthcare. And I'm going to bring you some good news. In my field of research, I'm going to talk about three breakthroughs. The first one is about privacy, privacy preservation. The second one is about analyzing the data using a new tool called deep learning. And the third one is about discovering causal relationships. And for each one of these three, there is a hero, as you will see. So let me first discuss the first one, preserving privacy. Now, what the machine learner or the data scientist really wants is to get his or her hands on all of the data in the world. That means all your DNA, everybody's DNA, everybody's full body MRI scan, everybody's clinical data, everybody's hospital visits, everything. Given all that data, the machine learner can develop revolutionary new treatments by simply observing all the doctors around the world and diagnose even the rarest of diseases. But the reality is quite different, as any practitioner will tell you. If you try to get your hands on a medical data set, you'll be waiting for years because the data has to, has to get through various privacy committees, and you're waiting. Now, let's be clear about it. I am not in favor of giving all that data to the machine learners and the data scientists, to give them free access to that data, because that's a privacy nightmare of Orwellian proportions. Now, what I do propose is to leave the data in the hospitals, but to let the algorithms move to the data in the hospitals where it's secure. It's like if the mountain doesn't want to come to Muhammad, Muhammad must go to the mountain. But we have to realize every time an algorithm interacts with data, we have to be careful that no sensitive information about any patient will be revealed. And it is here that the first hero enters the scene. Cynthia Dwork has developed a new revolutionary framework, 
in which machines and, and algorithms can interact with data in a sense that is completely respectful of everybody's privacy. And let me try to explain how that works. So there's a computer, and the computer wants to improve itself. It wants to be able to better diagnose cancer, let's say. And in order to do that, it's going to send a query to a database inside a hospital. And the hospital will comp compute the answer to that query. But it will also compute how much that algorithm can learn from answering that query about an individual patient. And then it will change the answer. It will randomly add some noise to it. And, before, and then it's sending it back. And then the algorithm will not know anything about individual patients, but by querying all these databases around the world, it can still build this really powerful model of the data, but in a privacy-preserving manner. So that's the first revolutionary breakthrough. Now I move on to the next one. Once we have our hands on the data in a privacy-preserving way, how are we going to analyze it? And it is here that my second hero enters the scene. It's Jeffrey Hinton. Jeffrey Hinton has spent a lifetime analyzing neural networks and developing neural networks. And recently, in 2009, he came up with a revolutionary new neural network. It's called deep learning, with many, many layers and millions of neurons. In fact, the deepest layers now are more than a thousand layers deep. And it works spectacularly well. In fact, everybody is familiar with this technology. It's sitting right here in your pocket. When you speak through your phone, and your phone understands you, that technology is powered by deep learning. But deep learning can do much more. It can even create art. So, here we see a Rembrandt, which was produced by a deep learning algorithm. And the experts were impressed. Next to it, you'll see an algorithm that takes in a photo and it will re-render the photo in the style of a painter. In this case, you will recognize Vincent van Gogh. But more relevant for today's lecture is that deep learning can analyze <coughs> medical images at an accuracy that is even higher than a human doctor. This is a histology slide where the algorithm is detecting cancerous cells. Now, once we have access to the data, and we are pointing our deep learning guns at the data, how are we going to, what are we going to learn from the data? And it is here that we can walk into a trap. The trap is that causality is not the same as correlation. Now, let me try to explain you this with an example. Recently, it was in the news that black cars are more involved in accidents than cars of another color. Now, that's a correlation. And in fact, insurance agencies have used this fact to raise your insurance fees if you have a black car. But it's hardly the blackness of the car that's causing the accident. In fact, it's the personality traits of the driver that cause the car to be black, because he likes black cars, and cause the accident. But it's important that in Healthcare, we are only important in causal relationships. We are not interested in correlations. We want to know which factors cause a disease. And we want to know which treatments help the patient recover. Now, let me explain to you how you can walk into a trap if you would just analyze the data. Here is again a correlation between a difficult birth and mental disabilities. It is known that this correlation exists. People have always thought that the difficult birth is actually causing the mental disability. Makes sense, right? But what's really true is that the mental disabilities are causing the difficult birth and difficult labor. Now, how can that be? It's because the brain of the mother and the brain of the child will have to coordinate in order for the smooth ride out. And it is here that the third hero enters the scene. Judea Pearl has developed a whole new set of tools that can distinguish correlation from causation. 
So with his tools, we can find the treatment that causes the effect. So it seems there's really one thing that we need to do. We need to get organized. We need to get all these patient files into digital form so that they can be read by machines in a privacy-preserving way. We want to structure the data. We want to link the data so that it becomes searchable. And we need new legislation that allows these data miners and data scientists to actually engage with this data in a privacy-preserving manner. If we achieve this, then I think we can revolutionize healthcare. We can save millions of lives. In fact, we can bring healthcare to corners in the world where there is no healthcare current, currently at all. Like here in Africa, using our cell phones. Maybe even we can create a world where young adults like Leslie will not have to die at such a young age. I'm working with my lab and my brilliant students and postdocs and colleagues every day to achieve that goal. I say, let's fly that healthcare rocket to the moon. Thank you. <laughs>